Welcome to session eight, structural steel in the KYTC structures inspection class level one. Since 2012, Kentucky has been one of the top states in the country when it comes to putting out structural steel bridges. In 2012, Kentucky had the Louisville, Southern Indiana, Ohio River Bridges project, which included a downtown cable stay bridge with rehab of the Kennedy Bridge, I-65 southbound, which is a steel trust member. Another construction of a cable stay bridge over the river at the uh, Kentucky 841 crossing. Uh, they conduct, constructed the two lake bridges, can bridge over Kentucky Lake on US 6880, bridge over Lake Barkley on US 6880, the Harrington Lake Bridge, the Milton Madison Bridge, and now here recently we've let the Spotsville Bridge in District 2, as well as a big curved girder bridge. So State of Kentucky has been busy letting structural steel bridges and in my mind they are more exciting to build. There's a lot more that goes with them. And if you like climbing, this is a bridge for you. If you don't like climbing, you don't like heights, probably not the best bridge to be an inspector on. So these start in the fabrication shop. Uh, we have a consultant inspection contract, currently it is with HRV, uh, that is the QC. They do all the work in the shop, they are certified weld inspectors, uh, they have engineers on board, they do all of our review and they do all of our on-hand inspection. Central office construction provides the quality assurance. We go into shops every six to eight weeks and we visit them to make sure they are in compliance with our specs, we're there to reinforce our consultant inspectors to kind of let them know that we care. Uh, we have a fabrication meeting before any work begins. We'll usually bring the section engineer up and we go to wherever the fabrication shop is. We've traveled all over from Minnesota to Wisconsin to Illinois to Indiana to Arkansas. We have one in Kentucky. I'm going to Pennsylvania soon. I've been to Virginia and I've been to Florida and Tennessee. So I've traveled all over going to these meetings. But the district is kept up to date by memorandums that are saved in project-wise. We keep them there, we put shop drawings, we put erection drawings, weld procedures, and other documentation, and all the daily work reports from our weld inspectors at the shop. The section engineer needs to read these because this may change how field erection work is done. The engineer and the inspector needs those erection drawings so they know how the bridge gets put together. Putting these bridges together are a lot like building a Lego car. Say you get a Batman car, and you got to put it together. It's got to be put together piece by piece in a certain order so it'll come together as what the box shows in the actual Batman car. Building a steel bridge, especially a complex steel bridge, is very similar. It has to go together in a set order. So the shop process or the drilling, they are done in place to ensure field fit up. So if you see here, this is a splice plate with all of its holes drilled into this one plate. It is attached to this girder web and this girder web. You can see the joint in between them and another plate on the back side. You can see a clamp here and a clamp here. They then come with a mag drill and drill each one of these holes. This member is blocked up at the base to make sure it is blocked to the exact camber that is specified for the bridge and elevation. They then drill each one of these holes. The hole itself is a 16th inch larger than the bolt diameter. So if you have a one inch bolt going to fill this hole, the hole itself is going to be one and one sixteenth inch in diameter. So a misconception I had when I first started working on these bridges was it was just the bolts that held them, like the physical bolt itself. I was wrong. It's friction that actually holds these together. These bolts are designed at a certain spacing and a set number to apply a set friction between plate here, web, and plate, and it is that friction that holds everything together. So the girder fit up must be done in multiple spans to ensure it's going to fit up in the field. We actually require three continuous members to be fit up and drilled and if you take member three off you or if you take member one off you then add member four but you've got to keep three continuous members together to make sure they get fit up in the field. So some problems that might be found during shipping. So if you look at the detail here, we have the web, the flange, top flange, bottom flange, and here we have some stiffeners that are added. So 
So these stiffeners are milled to secure an even bearing against the flanges. Open spaces are not permitted. So if you see here on the bottom, that bottom flange and the stiffener, the stiffener is milled to bear. That means it's been planed to be exactly flat to come into good intimate contact with that bottom flange. Uh, the corners are clipped and there's a 5 16 inch weld in this detail all around to hold it in place. But it's the weld just kind of keeping it from moving. That mill to bear is what's actually taking the load from the stiffener to the bottom flange. Flanges are not at right angle to webs. We've had some instances where say this top flange has a little bit of rotation to it. There's a little variation that's allowed there as per the AWS uh, D15 code, but our inspectors in the shops are verifying that. If it comes to you and it's got a flange tilt, ask the question before it ever gets off the truck. If you see a bow or a kink in any web page, plates, flanges, or stiffeners, stop, raise a red flag, ask the question, what's going on? We don't want any bows or kinks in anything. If you see a cracked or broken weld, definitely stop. If this girder cannot hold up during transportation, it's not going to hold up when in use. Stop it. Don't let it ever get off the truck. Make sure you get the contractor made aware of a crack so therefore an, an NCR can get ridden. It's a notice of non-conformance report. And we can get back to the fabrication shop and see what has happened here. Or if a fill or splice plate is tack welded to the girder during shipment, that's a big no-no. They're sent out with temporary shipping bolts. We'll see a picture of that in just a little bit, but we don't want anything tack welded because every time you get a weld on that, unless it's a continuous weld that's done in a certain manner, it actually causes micro cracking and that's not what we want. So as far as the cabinet goes, we don't allow any tack welding or field welding to our structure unless permitted by the central office or noted on the plans. So as it starts, they get made in the shop, they start rolling into your site. Just like when we did on pre-stressed beams in a previous video, they come in with a dolly in the back strapped down. This is where you want to look at it. This is your splice plate. And like I said, this cannot be tack welded. It must come in with shipping bolts. And these shipping bolts get thrown away because they are not structural bolts. They come in, chain down, you check them to make sure everything is good, make sure you check for the flange tilt. Make sure you see the stiffeners, check the bottom flange, the top flange, make sure everything is done in accordance with your shop drawings. Here's another picture of the bottom splice plates with the shipping bolts. Again, these shipping bolts just get thrown away. Just on pre-stress beams, you gotta check for the stamp. Uh, in the last eight years, we've had a contract with BV, Bureau Veritas, and HRV. Look for their stamp. This is what the BV stamp looks like. This is what the HRV stamp looks like. When I go to prefabrication meetings, I ask that they put that stamp in the same place on every girder or every member. That way you as the inspector know where to look. You're not having to hunt all the way around a member that's 150, 200 foot long trying to find a stamp that's only two inches. Make sure they're stored off the ground and braced. You can see here the six by six or eight by eight, by eight piece of timber. If they do get to the site and they're having to storm before construction or erection, make sure they're done properly. Here are some that got brought in. You can see they're stored off the ground and they're braced. You can see the stiffeners going along them. Another good picture, just close up seeing the stiffeners here and the braces holding everything together. Do not allow any grease or anything else on the steel, especially if you're using weathering steel and we're wanting to get that patina. If this is the case, you need to use some kind of solvent wipe to get that clean because in that instance, if it's on there, it's not going to weather at the same rate. It's not going to weather at all as compared to the other steel and it needs to be clean so everything goes. This same goes for concrete. When you're doing a deck pour on these and weathering steel, if they get concrete falls through on the decks, on the girders, they need to come in and clean them pretty quickly thereafter. So let's go into friction bolting. Like I said, the bolts cause friction and the friction is what holds everything together. So there's different ways to do install friction bolts. Calibrated wrenches has been the mainstay for years. You take a, a impact gun, you calibrate it to a set tension, you do that twice daily, you're good. Or turn of the nut, you mark the nut, you turn it some and you get it. 
here lately, especially on our new spec book, we have specified all structural steel bolts use direct tension indicators. These are DTIs for short. Uh, we'll talk about those and explain them a lot more, but that's what we specify. We use two different kind of bolts. We either use an A325 bolt or an A490 bolt. Those are our two grade bolts that we use based on spacing and that's up to the designer. But an A325 bolt that is not galvanized, so that's a black bolt, can be reused one additional time after initial tightening. So what that means is they tightened it all the way, something went wrong, they had to loosen it back. If you can look at it, say it visually looks good, it's not elongated, neck, bent, they can reuse it. That is the only one. If it's galvanized, cannot be reused. If they have to detension it, it gets thrown away. If it's an A490 bolt, it gets thrown his way as well. They cannot be reused. All bolts must get tested on the job site. This is done by the contractor and witnessed by the inspector. We test by the rotational capacity test. It's test per lot, per size. So it's in your advantage and especially the contractor's advantage to get everything in the same lot. That minimizes the testing. If you've got a lot of different lots, it maximizes your testing by a lot. Uh, it is necessary regardless. These are tested in the shop as well, but we're testing to make sure nothing happened in shipment, nothing got rusted, lubrication didn't fall off. And in any time bolt condition changes, say you have to order new washers and they're a different lot, you must go back and redo all your rotational capacity tests. This is done with a uh, tension tester. We use a Skidmore well helm. That is the brand that we most of our contractors use and is specified out and a torque wrench. Uh, there's a relationship. We're not really testing torque. We accept it based on tension, but there is a requirement of you must meet a tension at a minimum, at a maximum torque. If you have issues and you got a structural steel bridge, let us know as in central office construction. I have a whole separate class that goes through uh, friction bolting, structural steel bolting. We'll teach that to you and might even be able to come on site during this test to make sure it's done correctly. It is a team effort. You got a contractor who's actually using the torque wrench here with two inspectors. One inspector is looking here at the tension indicator. The other one's looking at the torque indicator. This tension indicator, the guy inspector is looking at it. He wants to hit initial tension. And when he does, he hollers. And this inspector looks and reads the torque. And they want to make sure that they hit their initial tension below that maximum torque that's allowed. So let's look at calibrated wrenches. Like I said in the beginning, this is a this is a bridge. If you like heights, you're good. If you don't like heights, probably you don't want to do it because these inspectors had to make their way out to this connection or iron workers had to make their way out to this connection to tighten these bolts. That means you have to get out there to test them. Like I said, a calibrated wrench gets tested twice daily, gets tested in the morning and calibrated, and it gets calibrated again at lunch, and they go. We test two out of every 10 bolts or 10% of the connection, whatever that goes, whichever is greater. So more than likely it's going to be 10% of the connection. So if there's 10 bolt, hundred bolts in this connection, you're testing 10 of them. What I ask of you as the inspector is if you make the effort to get out there, test as many as you can. It's just as much as taking a feeler gauge in there and testing whether or not they were good. Turn of the nut requires a lot more effort. That's why we want DTIs used. Turn of the nut, as you can see here, they marked the nut once it's snug tight. Mark the uh, member here of the structure member. And then you say this one's at two thirds of a turn. So they actually have to turn that until that mark lines up with that mark. You can go two thirds turn, half turn, three quarter turn, one third turn, whatever is designed for the size bolt. But they've got to do that. And the critical part of this is to make sure they are snug tight prior to marking. Here recent new to the market are turn of the nut guns. These are guns that you can actually set the gun to turn a half a turn or three quarters a turn and they have a setting on them for snug tight. A lot of contractors are going to these. They're lightweight. They're easier to transport. Uh, they do cost a little more, but they are some uh, make life easier on the iron workers. But this is the choice of the uh, contractor and fabricator, not the state. Our way to do it is we require DTIs regardless. DTIs have 
these rounded nubs on them. When they get tightened down, these are calibrated to squish and flatten out to make it almost like a washer. And you use this feeler gauge right here to stick it in there to test and see whether or not it can penetrate. The bolt, the washer, the DTI, and the nut all go together in a specific order. Make sure you review your shop drawings to make sure you are following that same order. Typically, it's the bolt with the DTI, and the DTI goes on the non-turning end, all the plates, then the washer, then the nut. That is the typical order, but I say review your shop drawings to make sure you know what is order is designed. Here's an inspector using a feeler gauge. Got a better picture here. He's using that feeler gauge, trying to stick it in there to see if it'll penetrate that opening. Again, if it penetrates 50% or more, it's not tightened enough, they need to come back and retighten it. I don't know if anybody knows what this is. It's something a lot of iron workers will want to jump to, but as a state, we don't want to use it any more than we have to. It's a reaming gun. So if you get a hole that they cannot get a bolt in, they're going to try to ream it. And understandable, it's quicker. But remember how we said these get fit together in the shop and they're drilled fit together and blocked. So it should go together unless something else has gone wrong. Uh, one of the things that could go wrong is say they fully tensioned everything up to a point, there's no give in it. Everything just needs to be snug tight, get everything together, and then go back and fully tension everything. But if it all does, there is a spec where we allow reaming and make sure you're following that spec. It's in section 607 of the spec book and make sure we don't go any over what we have to and please just check. Maybe you need to flip a plate. Maybe you need to rotate it. Do something. See if you can get them all to fit rather than reaming. All bolts nuts need to be stored correctly and they need to have the correct lube. Most nuts and bolts today are shipped pre-lubed that lubrication helps to get the tension that is required at the lowest torque they can. Because if there's too much torque on these, they will twist off. Lubes are identified by the bolt manufacturer and then are generally organic. But like I said, most come today already pre-lubed. You see, when you get on one of these jobs, these buckets are strewn out all over the whole bridge. Make sure they stay sealed up at the end of the day. If you get one that gets rained on and full of water, you might as well throw those bolts away or get them out, clean them, and re-lube them because they're going to get rust built on them, and rust means greater torque. Here, like I said, these crane operators make their money. They are well worth what they get paid. They have to fly this member in. Iron workers have to make sure it fits together. Another good picture of some plate girders coming in. You can see the splice connections that have been shifted out. They put them in. They get it lined up. The crane operator inches it into place and they make it. And you can see this one has got bolts all through it. These are snug tight. And then to get these to start going, they put in what is called a drift pin. Remember how I'd said the hole is a 16th inch larger. That drift pin is tapered on both ends up to a point in the middle that's the same size as the hole. You drive these in with a hammer, it snugs everything up nice and tight and it makes it to where the plate and the holes should align and you can just start stuffing bolts in there at that point. Like I said, if bolts are improperly lubed or stored improperly, you're going to break the bolt. Shear connectors, as far as we go as a state, unless specified in the plans, we install them after erection on site. Because one, it's a trip hazard if you install them in the shop. It's great and easier and more controlled in the shop, but can you imagine trying to walk on that in the field 80 foot above water tied off. I do believe it's a little bit of a trip hazard. But these are just like the stirrups that we talked about in the pre-stress. This is what makes it a composite deck with the beams. The concrete in the deck attaches to these studs that joins everything together to make it act as one. Field welding is not allowed on any portion of the steel structure unless it's required by the plans or permitted by central office. That has to come to us, we've got to review it, and the contractor, fabricator, iron worker must adhere to strict guidelines on how they're to do field welding. The only thing I've seen lately that's required field welding has been bearing to girder connections. Uh, welding is not to be utilized to attach any false work brackets, clips, gussets, filler plates, etc. There's other ways to get all those attached 
instead of welding. This is a weld. I'm not a certified weld inspector, but I can look at this and say, that's not a good weld. You want a good continuous weld from start to finish. When you're doing a steel structure, take special care during all the construction. Here you can see we're doing our deck pour. You see the bid well with the supports going down to the bottom. You want these supports for these overhang jacks at the bottom. You don't want them up in the middle because that girder is strongest down there at that connection with the web to flange. If you get it up in the middle of the web, you've got a weak spot, you could damage it. But also, the greatest strain and stress that this steel member is gonna go under is during the deck pour. Once that concrete cures and hardens, it's now all acting as one member instead of each individual member. There are some other structural steel items out there. You've got armored edges, expansion joints, and diaphragms. Diaphragms are incidental to structural steel and precast, uh, pre-stressed members. Armored edges and expansion joints are their own bid item, but they still fall under the same specification in 607 as all structural steel items do. Here you can see some armored edges and expansion joints in place. Here you see a channel diaphragm that's been put in and the intermediate uh, cross brace diaphragms are the same. The bolting falls under the same bolting. They have to hit the right uh, friction numbers and tension requirements to make sure they're bolted in place even on pre-stress uh, units. So paint, if paint is required, we are doing a lot of weathering steel girders and they have their place, but if this member is going to come into contact with any kind of chlorides, they must be painted. Uh, steel gets a prime coat in the shop. The state of Kentucky does not do uh, all three coats in the shop very much because of the additional work that's required in the field. But we do require it to be primed in the shop. And then it gets shipped out. That way it's protected. And then once it's built, they come back in. The contractor hires a paint uh, crew to come in and paint the final two co coats of the paint system. We have been kind of getting into the galvanized market. Uh, it's kind of new to us to still some test things and then like i said we do use weathering steel a lot just to get up to the thickness and sizes we need but if you're in an instance where you can get you don't have any joints and you don't have any drains on the bridge and you don't have any aerosolized salts coming up from below you can go with a weathering steel bridge and that patina will protect you here's a good picture of just a system where we had to paint the second street bridge in louisville you can see this protection for traffic below and then you can see as it looking in to make sure that we're not getting any paint on cars or anything else hopefully in new construction you get it painted before it's open to traffic but if you get in a time crunch and you got to get traffic open for a milestone date you might have to get in and do some protection like this but follow that uh, work with your paint inspector to make sure they are getting it done correctly and they're following all the guidelines for their certifications that is it for the structural steel portion of this class. Hope you enjoyed this video. Give me a like or share. Uh, if you have any questions, leave it in the comments. I will try to get back to you as soon as possible. And as always, I look forward to seeing you in class one day.